welcome to the Estranti Financial Training video on the operational case study for February 2017. And in this case, we are looking at Mavis Vanderbee. And what we're going to do in this video is look at the top 10 most likely unseen issues. So what we mean by that are the top 10 issues that we expect to come up in the actual exam in February. This is based on looking through the pre-scene and my knowledge of previous case studies, my understanding of how the exam works, how SEMA set their questions. And so putting all that together, we've put together a list of 10 likely areas in which there is an issue to come up. And the point of that is to try and help you kind of, uh, f figure out where to put your attention, focus your time and energy when it comes to revising and studying for this exam. So let's talk a bit about the basis of my choices. So one of the key areas that informs a whether whether or not a uh, an issue is likely to come up in the exam is how it's presented in the in the pre scene and what kind of focus is given it into it. Um, so for example, some things in this pre scene. Uh, if you read between the lines, you can kind of see that SEMA are hinting at this is something that's likely to come up in the exam. Because remember, SEMA have to create this pre-scene from scratch. They have to make up this company in this industry, and they've got to write questions for it in February. So they're going to be planting things in the pre-scene that, so that they can use those later on and turn those into questions. So if there's something has a lot of space devoted to it in the pre-scene, then that's generally a good indicator that it's something that's going to come up in the exam and also the degree of importance attached to it um, by the examiner. So again, if something has a lot of space or it seems to be very important in the pre-scene, then that generally means it's, it's likely to come up in the exam. Another area we focus on that informs the decision is the strategic importance of the particular uh, issue. So if it has an importance to SWOT, so we've done a SWOT analysis, and if uh, one of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats appears um, from, from looking at the pre-scene, we, we take those kind of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and the most salient ones that match what we get from the pre-scene are likely, again, to be uh, in the exam. In this case, the importance is likely to be attached uh, by the directors in this case. It might not be uh, It's kind of um, a, an organizational uh, wide issue. This might be something that you'd get uh, in the form of a question or a query from someone at the top level of management. And there's also a bit of my own experience here. So I've worked um, with the operational case study several times before. I've also worked with management and strategic st case studies uh, ever since they were introduced by SEMA a few years ago. I've also written an exam for SEMA um, uh, that, that was released uh, in SEMA Asia, which was a real exam that was actually sat by SEMA students. And for that, I was involved in the writing of the pre-scene and the writing of some of the actual questions. And so um, having done that, I kind of know how the process works and how you can um, put certain elements and hints into a pre-scene that help uh, you to figure out what's going to come up in the exam. So those are the main areas uh, the, the where I'm coming from in terms of these, um, what I think are going to be the top 10 issues. So having identified what I think are going to be the issues, how is that useful to you? What can you do with that? Well, as we've said, it can help you kind of prepare for the exam because if you can expect certain things are likely to come up, then you can prepare uh, particularly for those things. And specifically, you could take key models. So throughout this, I'll be suggesting uh, key models that are gonna be important. And you can re really sort of revise those and do those ahead of time. You can do your PESTEL, you can do your SWOT analysis, and your Portus 5 forces, do that ahead of time. So when you actually come into the exam, you'll have that information ready at hand. But the key point there, if you do uh, do any models or anything beforehand, is to remember, always adapt the models to the information given in the, in the unseen exam. So that's the actual exam you'll be sitting in February. You can do 
quite a lot in preparation by looking at the pre-scene, but remember that you are answering questions based on what's given in the exam, not based on your knowledge of the pre-scene. So it's very important to make sure you adapt and update any, any models that you've kind of completed um, to the new information given. Another great way to prepare is to practice mock exams that cover these issues. So at Astranti, we produce a whole set of mock exams specifically based around each pre-scene, and we'll be doing those mock exams pretty much based around the top 10 issues that we identify in this video. Another way to prepare is to find real life examples. So for the beekeeping industry, you could have a look around for real life beekeep, uh, for beehive manufacturers and see how they tend to uh, operate in real life, what are the trends of the industry, um, what are the sizes of the companies, how, how competitive are these markets, do they tend to be family firms, etc., etc. You can look at the real life and that will help to kind of inform how the business really works. And you could actually go as far as learning a few actual real life examples and pulling those up in the exam because the examiner loves to see that a student has shown a kind of a wider knowledge of the industry. So if you can talk about real life things that happen to an actual manufacturer of beehives in the real world, that's going to be that's going to look very good um, in the examiner's books. Another easy thing to do is to learn typical key points and this works particularly well for advantages and disadvantages. So for instance, if one of the issues is uh, looking at the relative merits of introducing a new costing system based on something more appropriate for the company, then you could kind of quite quickly reel off a number of advantages and disadvantages of whatever costing system it is. Uh, but you have to make sure and remember to apply it to the scenario. Don't just list off theory, make sure you've got the advantage and you try to apply that to the real the situation that you're given in the exam. And you should also be prepared for which models to use uh, to support the issue. So make sure you're using the models properly, make sure you use SWOT appropriately or Pestel appropriately, don't get them mixed up or use things where they're not really of much use at all. Okay, so let's actually get on with uh, what I expect to be the issues and we'll do it in reverse order, starting with number 10. And the number 10 issue for me is going to be funding. Now let's have a look at why, why did I choose funding? What is the basis of my choice of this? Well, for one thing, it's a key topic, uh, talking about the different kinds of funding, whether to use equity funding, that's um, selling shares to the public in order to raise finance to fund new projects, or whether to get debt financing. Um, it also impacts the cost of capital, and it would impact the dividend policy. Obviously, that's not something we're gonna worry about too much here with no shareholders um, other than the, the two directors at Mavis Venderby, but this is this is kind of it comes up again and again for these reasons. There's always an opportunity as well to use this as part of other questions. Um, often you'll find that a question will uh, propose a new idea, a new investment opportunity, a new project, and it will need funding. And what you will have to do is talk about what kind of funding would be appropriate based on the current situation at the company and any extra information you're given in the question. It's commonly examined, it often comes up. So I think that's generally, um, if it has come up in the past, it will come up in the future. That increases its chances of coming up. And of course, any new investment projects such as new products uh, are going to need cash um, to do so. Um, so that's the basis of the choice. Let's get in to um, some of the likely issues around funding then. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about long term funding. So Mavis Venderby have quite a few areas in which they could really devote some uh, money to kind of um, it growing the company and investing in new areas. One is new products. We've seen that there are quite a few areas in which Mavis Vendor B could develop new products, uh, new kinds of hives. We've already seen that research and development is going on um, for a kind of pheromone um, for hives and also things um, made of kind of animal enclosures that are sort of similar to beehives, but maybe perhaps a bit different. 
There's also talk in the pre-scene of polystyrene hives, which is something that Mavis Vendor B may choose to invest in. Uh, they may want to also start selling things like beekeeping equipment, uh, perhaps also selling um, honey or beeswax as well if they start farming or having their own beehives. And uh, if there's a new service as well, one thing um, that may be possible now that they have these new premises is that they might be able to offer a kind of beekeeper training course too. And all of these things are going to require funding and investment and that money's got to come from somewhere and so this is why I think it might be an issue. In a similar way as well, developing the premises is going to be a costly endeavour. Obviously Mavis Vendor B have just spent a lot of money buying these brand new premises and at the moment it seems like there's a lot of room for growth and expansion they're not utilizing it fully and so they're going to want to uh, develop that and get a bit more going on there that doesn't just come out of nowhere and that's going to need uh, funding whether or not they can do it just purely on the profits that they're raising uh, is questionable at the moment they don't seem to be uh, making a great deal of profit and they've just taken out a pretty large loan to fund this purchase so there are questions about how they're going to develop, to develop these premises now that they've purchased them. And so there may be a question on the choice of funding methods for these various projects. So you may get a proposal for a new product line or maybe um, it's introducing beekeeping accessories or an idea to develop the premises and you have to kind of advise on which funding methods are most suitable, whether to go um, this brings us on to the next question of raising future finance. So whether to use, basically whether to use equity finance, that's raising money through the sale of shares, or to raise debt finance, and that's selling off um, debts and call it having the sort of debt holders, uh, debentures and bonds and that kind of thing as well. Also, debt finance is bank loans um, as well. As we said, this is probably going to be paired up with an investment issue or a proposal for a new project. And what you'll have to do is kind of advise on um, how, how to fund it, basically. So if this is a question in the exam, if this does come up, then some of the things that you must raise um, in order to get the full marks that you need, some things that you absolutely must bring up um, basically the, the kind of basic theory around um, debt and equity and raising finance but making sure that you do apply it and tailor it specifically to the um, scenario so one thing you can talk about is the impact of debt on the company and how the current debt that they have has had um, has impacted the company so obviously the 1.5 million in loans that they've taken out in the previous year that went towards funding the purchase of the PPE. That's made that's meant that Mavis van der Beer have incurred finance costs and those are likely to be around for a good long while until they've paid off this debt. And it's also increased the gearing ratio. Remember the gearing ratio is the measure of debt to equity and it kind of shows roughly how the company is financed and generally the, you want a kind of mix of the two. Um, too high debt though is usually a bad sign and so though gearing has increased in this case it's increased from um, zero to um, sort of around about 10 or 11 percent so that's a reasonable gearing ratio that's not too bad at the moment but taking on further debt uh, is going to push that up and up and the higher the gearing goes the less kind of desirable it becomes and one of the things we said on the previous page is invest this investment uh, in the new PPE if they do find themselves short on cash or in need of some finance then one thing that they could do is to use that these premises um, to raise funds so they could perhaps lease out certain parts of it to other companies and get money income from that lease Okay, so we talked a bit about debt and equity, so it would be worthwhile to just go over the kind of appropriate order of when to start incurring debt and when to um, start using equity finance. So for small projects, generally, the, uh, the, the trend seem, tends to go that for small projects, you use your own cash, um, money generated from profits and sales, obviously. And for smallish projects, things that are perhaps short term or don't require a lot of capital, you can use cash for this. 
Okay, and then when you would move on to uh, debt funding in that case, if you didn't have enough, enough cash to finance a particular investment, that's the case when you would perhaps first and foremost probably go to the bank, um, maybe starting off with a smaller loan, smaller loan um, perhaps selling some of your existing assets to get uh, to increase your cash, um, but then you would go for a longer term loan. And that seems to be the stage that Mavis Vendor B are at here is to use debt funding, uh, which they use to purchase these new premises. Um, but later on, um, you want to kind of move on to equity to avoid driving your debt up too much. Um, but this is kind of a last resort because it is very costly and it kind of completely changes the nature of the business. And this means that the owners may not want, may not kind of like the idea of it because they're kind of losing control of their business and it's going to the shareholders. And that can be a major reason why uh, owners don't want to start selling shares publicly. And it seems that Mavis Vendor B is a family company, fairly traditional. They may not want to be sort of um, thinking about going public anytime soon. So they're going to want to stick to these first two methods of uh, using cash and debt funding um, to fund their projects. Okay, so some theory that you can use then uh, in preparation for this and if this exam, uh, if this does come up in the exam, um, some of the kind of easy ways that you can prepare for this is to just talk about the relative merits of debt and equity. So the general uh, the general benefits of using debt is that it's quick, it's cheaper, and it's a lower cost form of funding. So that tends to be why uh, people go for that one first. And as we've said, this is this is the route that Mavis Vendor B seem to have gone down already. So they're kind of they're taking the they're making the kind of correct uh, progress in regards to this. Um, but with equity, obviously, it has its own benefits. Things like uh, dividends are optional. This is what you pay on the kind of the from the privilege of being able to raise the money. You pay a dividend to the shareholders. These are optional, and obviously with debt, um, interest is isn't uh, optional. It's usually compulsory, and there's no need to pay back the capital at the end. So with a loan, you obviously still have to pay that money back. With equity, what you're giving up is a share in the company. And as we've said, maybe spend to be unlikely to go down the equity route, but on the sort of unlikely chance that that is uh, is a proposal in the exam, then you would probably need to talk about um, the, the kind of drawbacks of um, going public. Okay, so issue number nine we have next, and that is a possible staff uh, management issue, kind of the relationship between the staff and the management. And here we have a picture of kind of workers uniting to revolt. And let's see what kind of thing we mean by this then. Okay, so again, it's a common issue in past exams. It's come up time and time again. So that again means that it, it is quite liable to come up again in the future. There is absolutely nothing in the pre-scene about unions and very little, in fact, on uh, workers in general. So this could mean that SEMA are holding back on this and they're waiting to bring something up in the unseen exam. And of course, it's just generally important to an organization that the staff and the management have a good relationship and they are able to kind of work well together um, for the benefit of the company as a whole. So the likely issues based on the pre-scene then one of the main ones is that there is no de dedicated or devoted HR function. Um, Thomas van der Bee, the managing director, has taken on the kind of role of managing HR. But it almost seems like a kind of afterthought, like something he's done kind of just on the side. And this is this is slightly worrying because um, as the company grows and gets bigger, this is uh, this is this is something that becomes more and more important. Another potential issue is health and safety. Uh, we're not told much about this in the pre-scene, uh, but obviously Mavis Vendor B are a manufacturer. You have workers working with machinery and production line, and they're working with wood, and they're making building things. And so that raises questions about health and safety. What are the conditions like in the factory? And uh, is, is everything uh, uh, sort of working well there? And obviously, without any sort of dedicated HR team, then if there are any self 
if there are any health and safety issues, then staff may not know where to go to talk or to complain about anything like that. And so you can start to see how this kind of uh, relationship between staff and management could begin to break down. We know that Mavis Venderby use a kind of basic recruitment program for getting new trainees on board and they have a six month sort of probationary period and then full time staff are taken on after that. But other than that, we aren't told too much about it and we don't know whether what the kind of requirements are for staff, what sort of what it is they have to do in order to get the job at the end. And so there may be some kind of issues around that, around certain um, people on the kind of recruitment scheme not getting jobs at the end and not sure why and again this sort of there is perhaps scope for an issue uh, around there and all of these become amplified by the fact that um, there is again there's no devoted HR function within the company and of course all of these issues could lead to the threat of strike action like we said we don't know if there is any union there's been no speak of any union but we do have uh, sort of workers sort of load skilled unskilled and sort of, um, sort of partially skilled workers here and so this is the kind of thing that would have a union and there may well be uh, unions involved uh, with the workers at this stage it certainly is a popular has been a popular thing to come up in exams in the past and there's no reason why it couldn't come up in this exam as well okay so a few more likely issues as well less sort of revolving around um, the kind of the idea of a strike and unions uh, one could be that a key staff member leaves, um, most likely someone uh, at the senior level or at the management level uh, could be leaving and as they are leaving, they're kind of leaving a hole in the uh, company. They may have been over-reliant on this particular person and it would be difficult um, and that, that, could, that, could be, that certainly could be an issue. And equally kind of on the opposite way, uh, one of the uh, key member of staff uh, could ask for a pay rise or be threatening to leave if they don't get a pay rise and again this is most likely to be a higher uh, mem high level member of the team uh, because they have a bit more power and they kind of know that they can push for perhaps a higher salary or something like that. Uh, this becomes particularly interesting when we sort of give uh, sort of notice that uh, Thomas and Jacinta are siblings, they're brother and sister, and they own the company between them, they own 50% each, and Thomas is the managing director, and Jacinta is the sales and marketing director, and there is a potential for some sort of conflict between the two there. Um, we don't know, not necessarily, but there, there may be uh, potential for conflict between there, um, since uh, Jacinta is technically reporting to her brother, and equal share sort of owner um, who is her superior. And one other thing as well might be staffing issues due to growth. Now as the company gets bigger, there's going to be kind of strain on the current staff to maintain the quality that they've uh, that maybe some vendor be of kind of um, uh, that their customers expect of them. There might be issues around being able to train uh, new staff in the, the required skills that they need to do certain tasks within the company and so there are again this sort of there are certainly scope for staffing issues uh, due to the company's growth okay so again if this does come up in the exam if there are any staff uh, management kind of relationship issues then things that you must raise uh, in this case we can kind of talk about um, strikes and how to kind of negotiate regarding a strike what the best uh, approach is here so we can talk about kind of reasons from the business perspective to avoid a strike now there's obviously lots of reasons to avoid it and we've listed those here um, but these are the kind of things you can bring up in the exam so obviously one of the major things is we're going to lose revenues during the strike period obviously the production the people that would normally be doing the work aren't going to be working there, they're striking, so products aren't made, fewer sales, lower revenues. There's going to be a lack of motivation among the staff after the strike ends, particularly if it doesn't end the way that they wanted to. It's bad publicity, um, that's, that's an obvious one. Any company that has a strike kind of shows that there are, um, there are tensions between the management and the staff. Social responsibility is important to the business and strike action kind of suggests that they aren't doing their bit to be uh, socially responsible and it can impact the brand which could be particularly important uh, uh, damaging 
for Mavis Vanderbeek who have kind of a good reputation in the industry. On the other side of that, you have to argue for uh, why not to give in too easily. Now, if you kind of bend over too easily for the unions or the, the workers and the demands, then you face problems as well. Obviously, you have to kind of um, be stern but fair because obviously change is necessary. Um, change is obviously necessary uh, for companies. And uh, at the end of the day, it is the owners of the company and the managers who are sort of running the business and they have their strategic aims and so the staff need to be on board with those changes and um, the other issue is if the strike goes on for too long and the company starts making losses then the company will likely go into liquidation it might go bankrupt and then everyone will lose their job as well so there's two reasons why uh, why it's important to be stern as well so in the exam the key is to kind of um, try to find a balance between the the various points that we've raised here. Don't focus um, too much on any one thing. And always remember that you have to apply it to the scenario. So some of these might not be quite so important uh, given the information in the exam. Some of these will be more relevant. So if it does come up in the exam, some of the things that you can use. One is Lewin's uh, unfreeze, move, refreeze model. This is kind of a theory this kind of goes in how to approach managing kind of staff, uh, how to uh, sort of get them on board with a change and um, make sure that it's well managed in order for it to be a successful change. Otherwise, you're going to find staff aren't on board with it and the change is a failure. You can look at Mandela's matrix as well. So looking at stakeholder mapping, seeing which stakeholders involved in the dispute are most important and what can be done to kind of appease them and keep them satisfied. And we could also potentially use Hertzberg's, Hertzberg's motivation theory, trying to get to the bottom of what it is the staff really want, what it is they're unhappy about and what it is they want from their jobs and what, what it is that's causing this strike. So all of this should be familiar to you uh, from your E1 studies. And these are all relevant things that you could bring up uh, in, in a kind of strike scenario. All that remains for me to say is thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll just take a few moments of your time if I could to just tell you about some of the other case, stu case study materials that we offer. So one of the things is a study text. Now this is a study text specifically aimed at the case study and we have one for each level. So we have an operational management and strategic level one and they're designed to help you pass the study. They're in two halves. The first half is exam tips and this exam strategy and advice on how to answer questions and all the really useful kind of tips that you need going into these exams and how to prepare for them. And then the second half, the second part of those is a recap of the key theory that always comes up in the case studies again and again. So those are really useful, really valuable thing that you can get. Uh, those are available online and you can get the, an actual textbook, a print physical textbook for the old fashioned among you who like to do it that way still. Uh, we also have course videos that correspond uh, with that study text as well. So we have a series of really nicely well produced, well done videos uh, in which we basically take you through exactly what's involved in the case study and how you can uh, spend your time preparing for it to ensure that you get really good marks. It's really, really great um, series of videos there. We've got the pre-scene analysis, which the video you just watched is an example of the pre-scene analysis. And there'll be several more videos just like that, where we look at every every tiny detail of the pre-scene and we relate it back to the, the P1 or F1 or E1. And we relate it to real life scenarios, relate it to uh, actual business and analysis tools. And we give you the um, what we expect to be the top 10 issues. Another thing that we do slightly different is the industry analysis and that is a really, this is a really great document in which we basically cover everything um, that's relevant to the industry for the particular business that we're looking at. And it goes from the history through to the, the customers and suppliers and the market and how the market has functioned and the history of that. And we've got statistics in there and diagrams and it's full of information and it's so, so useful. And at the end of that pack, we also have 25 actual industry examples. So real life things that have happened in that industry that um, kind of examples of things that might actually happen to this, uh, to the company in the exam. So it gives you a sense of the kind of things that are going on 
in the industry and how real life businesses in that industry have coped with it. We have mock exams, which are, if you were gonna pick any one of these to do, I would suggest it was the mock exams because nothing prepares you for the exam more than actually sitting a mock exam. And if I were, if I were a student taking this, I would certainly put mock exams at the top of my list along with marking and feedback. Now our mock exams are actually um, designed to match the way that the actual SEMA exams are so you can sit them on your laptop and they'll be timed and automatic and they are as close as you are gonna get to the real thing. And you can get marking and feedback on that as well, which is probably the most invalu uh, valuable thing you could probably get to get specific feedback from, uh, from a marker who is, deals with this exam four times a year that's the best way for you to improve your uh, your ability to pass this exam as quickly as possible. We also have a masterclass. So as an online company, we hold an online masterclass, which you can sign up for. And it's a, um, a day over, over the weekend. We do the Saturday and a Sunday. And it's, it's a full day's worth of a, we have an expert who, who takes an online seminar and we go through everything um, specific to that case study that you can do to get prepared for the exam and we cover all sorts and it's very very popular among students who like a one-on-one -on -one kind of classroom environment um, in an online in an online situation we also offer pass guarantee so if you do uh, if you're unlucky enough to not uh, pass your exam the first time round, then there's no worries because we give you the option if you if you choose a pass guarantee option, then if, as long as you hit all the basic all the all the minimum requirements that we ask, and you don't pass, then you get uh, you get access to our materials for the next sitting, uh, completely free of charge. So there's there's something that we're doing to try and to try and get you. Um, hopefully, if you if you signed up to our course and you do everything that we say you should do, then you probably will pass first time. That tends to be the way it goes. But if you should be unfortunate, if it's a particularly tough exam, then we'll let you have another go um, for free. So that's it. Thanks again for watching. Remember, my name is James. You can find me on Facebook, James Nutting Astranti, where I'll be posting all sorts of information about the upcoming exam in February. Make sure you check that out. Um, because there's always something to talk about with regards to that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.